Welcome to Russian History with Dr. Brovkin. Today our topic is who is Alexei Navalny and why did he die? The simple answer to this complex question is it depends who you ask. If you look at the Western media covering this event, there is no question whatsoever. They all blame President Putin. Putin ordered him killed. Uh, for these people, Navalny is a martyr, is a hero, he's a fighter, he's an, a critic of Putin, he's the a noble exposer of corruption in Russia, uh, and the leader of, a, of an opposition movement uh, to change the uh, dictatorial regime in Russia, and this is why he was killed. This is the standard Western interpretation. And then the consequences are there should be more sanctions on Russia, that Putin should be declared non grata, uh, that, that nobody has to do anything with him, that he should be tried for the violations of uh, human rights, etc., etc. Now, for the liberal opposition in Russia, uh, Navalny is definitely a hero. Um, these people are uh, intelligentsia in Moscow, all kinds of um, young people. He's really very popular among the young people, as indeed he's uh, courageous, he's uh, definitely um, fearless, and despite all kinds of uh, uh, articles that he was charged with, he continued his uh, opposition activity. In fact, as a psychological type, Navalny is very much in the tradition of Russian rebels. Uh, these are people who willingly went to uh, uh, all kinds of terrorist acts or revolutionary acts in the uh, early years of the 20th century just to be arrested and sentenced to Siberia, and they willingly did it as a kind of carrying their cross uh, with almost religious zeal. Um, if we look back at the biography of Alexei Navalny, he started, uh, as a matter of fact, as a Russian nationalist. Uh, he led it a movement that's called Ours, which means Nashi, and it was radical uh, nationalists. Uh, he was also at some point um, against the Ukraine, and uh, this is why the Ukrainians don't like him. But then he changed, and he joined uh, the uh, liberal opposition uh, of Boris Nemtsov, and uh, in the late 1990s, he went to the United States on a program of leadership studies. And he was recommended by uh, Yevgeny Albats, and, and these are the people, as a matter of fact, I met and I knew when I was at Harvard in the 1990s. These are the people who were associated with Nemtsov, who, the, who in the 1990s in the, West, in the West were called the Dream Team around Yeltsin. These were very pro-Western. They wanted, uh, they had friends among the oligarchs, they wanted privatization, democratization, uh, like in the West. So these are very Western-oriented audience. So Navalny was from that type. Uh, and what's interesting about the this opposition in the early uh, years, uh, in the first decade of the 21st century, is that they were uh, uh, they criticized Putin for not doing enough. They were not at that time systemic opposition, means uh, totally against the system. They they, they were saying uh, this is the roads are not enough construction and the mothers are not enough help and everything was not enough and they would do it better. So this was kind of like a normal opposition that in the sense that they criticized what the government did and they wanted to propose something better. Now, after the um, 2012 demonstrations, uh, uh, when uh, was the peak of uh, Navalny's career, when after that he tried to be elected as a mayor of Moscow, got 27 percent, his opponent got 52, but nevertheless he was a public figure. Then he goes into his latest stage, which was, it's called non-systemic opposition, which means that they were outside the system, which means he wants a regime change. And if you were to ask him it was if it were possible, he would agree with what I'm saying now. He is against Putin regime as such. Uh, so people who support him are the people today who hate Putin just Putin and anything that's associated with him. It's no longer a matter of policy. No matter what policy Putin pursues, they are against it. Uh, so this is the kind of a 
uh, this is why it's called non-systemic opposition. Another thing that, that one should be aware of is that uh, Putin is not the only one who had uh, who c could conceivably had a grudge against Navalny. Uh, in this so-called uh, fight against corruption, he touched uh, a lot of people, and and many of these people would be pretty furious with him for what he published. So, um, so for example, there's a doctor Malishova. He's very very famous in Russia. She she has two TV um, programs on health, and just about everybody in Russia knows her. So he published a short film exposing the wealth of Malishova, saying that she has real estate in America, that her children are in America, uh, and. Uh, See, of course, this would be like a character assassination because this would be non-patriotic. Uh, another important thing is Malashova earned her money totally legitimately. She runs two TV stations, two TV programs daily. She's she's got enough money to buy real estate in America. But in this, nevertheless, her reputation plummeted after that. So he did the same thing with the prime minister. Um, he 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 made a short film about him uh, exposing his wealth, and that in Russia is assumed as corruption because if you're rich, that means you're a thief. As this is how it was in the 1990s, uh, there's no way you could have made the money legitimately. Now in Russia, there are a lot of rich people who made it legitimately, and so the fact that prime minister has this or that does not necessarily imply that. Uh, that he was corrupt, and so th this would be also a person who would had a grudge against him. They would he made the same thing of former President Medvedev, and he attacked him with corruption and so forth. So what is corruption? Uh, corruption is, and I worked professionally on corruption. I have a huge article that was published, "Corruption in Russia." Uh, corruption was really bad in the 1990s. Just about everybody was corrupt from police officers on the street corner uh, to um, ministers and others um, but the in the uh, later years of putin there was a serious struggle against corruption and i counted there were about six or seven governors who were charged with corruption and uh, imprisoned uh, by president putin's uh, authorities and courts so one cannot say there is no struggle with corruption. There is. Now there's still a lot of corruption. That's true. But that doesn't mean that uh, th there's nothing being done against corruption. Th the reason that uh, Navalny uses corruption is that he wants a regime change. He wanted to re to to basically uh, stir up a kind of a popular movement like in Kiev and Maidan to overthrow the government. Now, uh, all these years he was given short sentences, like one or two years conditionally. Uh, then when he was um, poisoned um, uh, in this so-called Novichok case, uh, it was conditionally. He, he basically broke the parole and came back to Russia after he was uh, sent to be treated in Germany. By the way, this is a separate huge topic, but there is quite a good reason to believe that uh, that the authorities has nothing to do with his poisoning because if they really wanted to poison him they would have poisoned him so that he's dead but if they poisoned him not and good enough and then sent him to allowed him uh, actually Putin publicly said that his wife asked him uh, asked Putin to let him go to Germany to be treated and he said yes he, he can go and then he went and then the German authorities whatever they found in his body they still have not revealed it so this is very strange if they had found Novichok why wouldn't they make a public uh, official announcement but they didn't so he comes back to Russia breaking his parole and then he's imprisoned again for a year or two this was 2021 uh, and and then he got into really big trouble and that is when he um, started um, his uh, association with what is called in Russia extremist organizations, which means basically he started to call for the overthrow of Putin's regime. Uh, this is when they were, uh, and then uh, there was quite a, a good uh, reason to believe uh, evidence that, that his uh, NGOs were getting money from the West. 
So uh, let me now go to how he's perceived by uh, ordinary Russians and then by his opponents. Ordinary Russians uh, basically are either indifferent, many of them you would ask him who is Navalny, they would have no idea, or they would just hear something on TV that he was killed, but they would really have no say whatsoever. Uh, the young people in the big cities, uh, they they would bring flowers and they would feel that, that the hero and the martyr um, is, is Navalny. Uh, but also, I should say, this is a part of Russian culture. The Russians really, as people, they like martyrs. They like people who are not afraid of authorities. They like rebels who are courageous and who are sufferers for the truth. This is so, so many, so Russian to cherish somebody who suffered for the truth. Uh, actually, Dostoevsky wrote about this uh, as, as, as part of the Russian soul. But in any case, this, uh, he does come across as a very positive fellow. However, uh, uh, let's now move to those people who don't like him. And these are the Russian patriots. Uh, and these are Russian nationalists. And these are the, the people who are with the authorities. So they, the, the, and there are people in the West, if you look Un's review, uh, and if you look at Scott Ritter and others, um, in Un's review, an American observer called him a rat and a traitor. And so this gives you a totally different idea of attitudes towards Navalny by those who don't like him. So Russian patriots don't like him at all and they do call him a, a rat and a traitor. Um, and so their argument goes like this. So this guy is criticizing corruption and is criticizing people who having real estate in the West. But look at himself. He has money from the West flowing. He has his children, his daughter at Stanford University. He he has real he has connections and money in the West he gets money from the West to produce films discrediting Russian official uh, figures and politicians and others uh, and then he pretends like he's fighting for democracy when in fact he's uh, basically trying to stir trouble in Russia to weaken its war effort uh, and to discredit the uh, president so they actually uh, dislike him uh, very much. Uh, and also, uh, when people point the finger at President Putin, let's not forget, there were many other people who have reason to dislike him or have a grudge against him or who would want to revenge. And these are many of those who he created films and other publications uh, accusing them of corruption or of theft, uh, whereas, as in the case of Malashev, there was no theft, there was honestly earned money. So, uh, my argument is that there was a, um, a lot, there were a lot of people who could have had a grudge against him. Now, could it be, how did he die? Could it be that President Putin ordered a hit? I doubt it, simply because we ask a question it's possible, but I doubt it. Well, I was the question, was it beneficial for President Putin? It was not. Uh, it was not because the outcry of the West uh, and the accusations of him being a killer and, and, uh, are, are back again on the scene exactly at the time when he published a very successful interview with Tucker Carlson where he tried to come across as a person offering peace. So the time of it, to the timing of it just basically shows it couldn't have been Putin. Now, then, of course, people would argue he was slowly poisoned, and then he just died in an in a, inopportune moment. Now, again, if Putin is so powerful, then why would he poison him in a way that he would die when it's not convenient? They could have poisoned him in a way that it would be perfectly legitimate uh, from the outside. It would look legitimate. So, uh, I doubt it very much. The, the, the most likely uh, outcome, it seems to me, uh, is that he had a clot, just as RT, uh, RT has uh, published. Uh, he had health issues before, he went on a hunger strike a couple of times, uh, and he could have had a, a clot uh, and then died. That is most plausible. However, uh, is it possible that the authorities ordered him? Maybe. And, and just as comparison, let me finish on this. Uh, let's think of what would happen 
uh, in the United States to a person who published uh, material accusing a president of the United States of corruption, of owning a palace somewhere, uh, or of uh, being a killer and uh, murdering opposition figures. Um, people who marched on Washington on January 6 are in prison. Uh, they're considered rebels and they are in prison and nobody thinks that this is particularly a violation of human rights, not in the United States at any rate. Um, now, Julian Assange published documents exposing um, uh, various misdeeds of U.S. government. And if he's extradited to the United States, he faces 175 years in jail. Now, we can continue. Um, Epstein, who had some dirt on uh, various people, is died in jail. And so far, there's no investigation. There's nobody knows who killed him. And nobody accuses the president of the United States of killing him or somebody else who could have been uh, touched by the revelations. Uh, and the list goes on. The, the person who leaked DNC documents wound up dead. And nobody would think of accusing the president of the United States of ordering the hit. It just doesn't enter the realm of the possibility. Then uh, in the West, we are brought up with the condition, with the stipulation that the person is innocent until proven guilty. How in the world could President Biden know less than 24 hours after Navalny's death that it was Putin who did it? That proves actually that he didn't know that this is just a political accusation thrown in just like that uh, without any proof whatsoever. Uh, and that makes me very suspicious that, that that is all just political propaganda. We don't know who killed Navalny. If anybody killed Navalny, most likely nobody did. In any case, uh, in this expose, I tried to show you that if you ask who killed Navalny? The answer is, it depends who you ask. Uh, what do you think about Navalny? It depends who you ask. Some, for some people, he's a hero. For other people, he's a traitor. Thank you, and I'll see you next time with another edition of Russian History with Dr. Brovkin. Subscribe and put your likes if you, if you did like it. Thank you. Bye-bye.